Hey everyone, I'm Jack and welcome back to our series ranking every boss in the Arkham Quadrilogy. After a rather unmemorable visit to Arkham Island, this urban mega prison put a new twist in the formula Asylum created and set a higher standard for future bosses. The improved combat and revamped predatorial systems added much depth to a rather pale set of villains and elaborated on the terrible boss index Arkham Asylum left behind. With that out of the way, let's hop in with one of the biggest letdowns in the series. You're next on my list, Batman. When discussing F-grade bosses, this blundering klutz of a marksman is my go-to example. What makes him so awful is not that it's at most 20 seconds long, nor that you don't even fight him, but rather he's a terrible sum up to what came before him. A one-tap takedown on a random rooftop with no emotional or atmospherical strings is the best way I can put this and from a predator standpoint, Deadshot was an absolute failure as well. There was a lot of expansion they could have done as well, such as ricochet bullets, better scoping, or a more advanced and challenging path to him, but as he is, he was uninspired and unoriginal, so I digress. Looking back, if the devs did something similar to how he was done in Origins, it would be a lot more competitive in the top 5. But I think he suffers from a small time frame in development between Asylum and City, so he sucks. And the judgment is... DEATH! Without question the most underdeveloped boss I've ever seen, Two-Face is really bad. To get it out of the way, I'm not talking about Harley Quinn because her achievement has like a 1% completion on Xbox and fair warning, you're missing nothing. It is the exact same thing in a different arena and instead of playing as Catwoman, you're playing as Robin. Now, back to Two-Face. Now that we've prefaced, I've got something big to admit. I got zero clue how to do this fight, and evidently I'm not alone, considering every single tutorial on this boss is different in some way, shape, or form, and it only furthers my point about how unclear the design of this fight is. To be frank, my go-to strat is to beat him up and tank the bullets, which is quite ironic as this was built around Predator. Predator is basically impossible though because your silent takedown makes Two-Face shout for help, resulting in a swarm of bullets from his crew. Come to think of it, the true difficulty doesn't come by way of Two-Face, more so his henchmen. As a matter of fact, Two-Face alone is a piece of cake. I rarely get hit by him because he shoots at a reasonable pace for an RPG and his AI is very primitive so it's easy to avoid him. On the contrary, his crew spawns infinitely, are maxed out on AI, and do not miss a shot. They make up for Two-Face's laughable ease via staying in close proximity throughout and also dealing an absurd load of health if you get caught in their crossfire. Your only chance at getting away once you take him down is running, because yeah, the room is full of gargoyles, but they get randomly shot out once you inevitably get spotted, so it's best to just avoid them anyways. Retrospectively, this could have been a really good boss if they had just made Two-Face more formidable by himself. I think it would have been real interesting to see him alone with a wider array of moves in comparison to stuffing the room with extra bodies. I could keep going on, but you get my point. Let's move on to something a little better. When you wake up, you will be mine. It is pretty amazing how a combat map is higher than two legitimate bosses, but that's about where the praise ends because sure, Mad Hatter is number 9, but he beat out Dumb and Dumber, so there's not too much to brag about. The main issue I have and why he's in the 9th slot is due to how little substance there is throughout. Personally, I believe the fight should have been a segment in an overarching mission such as how he was done in Origins instead of being the climax to his story. It also doesn't help that all you do is get into free flow and bounce around like a pinball, one tapping basic enemies in every minute or so Mad Hatter. That being said, I wouldn't expect too much from the guy because historically, he is more of an atmospheric character than a physical one, but it was admittedly underwhelming to rinse and repeat the same thing four times over. Luckily, I think we've moved past rock bottom in this game, so it can only get better from here. This is hardly a surprise. I always knew I was better than you! While being almost the exact same as Deadshot on paper, Riddler was at least original and there was an obvious lack of disappointment which puts him up so much higher. If anything, the racetrack was the one thing that prevented this from going in last because honestly I found the racetrack to be surprisingly difficult and I actually died a couple of times. But, after a bit you'll notice the AI is always the same, so you catch on pretty fast. In terms of the consistent AI, it's actually pretty lousy from my point of view that it's the same thing over and over, and just like Deadshot, there should have been more to do than just waltz on under him. For example, there could have been either multiple routes, or a few different versions of the actual track that switch if he spots you. No matter what, the ending was my favorite part by a mile. The Riddler was such a damn nuisance throughout the whole game, so to put him in his own trap was not only hilarious, but felt really satisfying as well. So, for what he is is more of an annoying and comedic character than anything else, it's fair that Riddler gets a pass in my book. Batman. 
As one of the most daunting characters in Arkham for beginners, the way most people look at these twins changes dramatically over the course of a single playthrough. For example, and I'm going to be straight up, I was terrified of them my first time around, but now I don't see them as anything more than prime beatdown material because that's what they are. To be honest, they exist solely to give you free flow, rest, and ample time to scope out your surroundings, and this is proven because they only appear in giant brawls as combo fodder. Don't get me wrong, I do like them though. They're admittedly fun to jump over and wail on for a minute until they're out, and they're meant to be easy so I can't really complain. So yeah, while definitely being nothing to cry home about, these Soviet speed bags were a pretty good time and I liked them enough from the appearances they made to give them the in-between spot. Oh, bats. I really figured you'd last longer than that. Let me start this off by saying this was a total adrenaline rush. The second that chilling cutscene ends, you're getting mobbed by the Joker and his thugs, and the fight keeps adding to itself with additions such as Mr. Hammer, a Titan, and even smaller components such as the train. But the adrenaline pump stops right about there, because yeah, it's fun and there's not a lot I would change, but that's really all that's going on. Just a massive cluster of varying enemies in a tight room. I'm truly sorry for the minimal amount of commentary on some of these, but I don't want to keep repeating myself throughout this video. Originality is something that's very important to me, and even as fun as he was, this clay counterfeit shouldn't go any higher than number 6. <laughs> By far the most controversial placement on this list, we have Titans making their surprisingly good return at number 5. I understand the argument that these guys probably aren't actual standalone bosses, rather bits and pieces of fights. I get that, which is why they get a mid-table spot, but I had an awesome time with these guys and I think Rock City realized the mistakes they made in Asylum and took the time necessary to make it work in their next project. In terms of the Titans movesets, they're actually semi-difficult and the Titans themselves added some much needed intensity to the bouts they came in. They're also simply more fun than their primal counterparts thanks to the revamped Titan Rod. In Asylum, it felt like you had no control at all, while now you're saddled up in our full throttle knocking down goons left and right. I also enjoy the super stun mechanic because it forced you to be smart about when to attack. And take my word, a little bit of more focus and intense timing segments such as the super stun would have definitely made the OG Titans more passable. Either way, it is definitely a controversial placement, but the total rebuild of Titans from the ground up is deserving of the high praise, high placement, and most importantly title of boss in my opinion. Grundy will kill you. Just barely missing out on the top 3 is the Immortal Solomon Grundy and the not so much Penguin. To get straight into it, my main gripe and why this fight is not top 3 is that the overall formula never changes. The first two phases were fun, but after destroying 12 of those Tesla machines over and over, a third phase was either unnecessary or needed to have a different way of taking them on. As much as I don't like the way you take them on, I really like the boss. Grundy himself was designed very well in that he has a separate moveset in each phase, but he's similar to Clayface in that he's just not that challenging by himself, so it didn't feel very game changing. If there were different overall mechanics in each phase, he could have been the best in the game. But the fight lasted way too long and just like Killer Croc in Asylum, the atmosphere and excitement drops tremendously fast. I do have to give a shout out to Grundy's ending though. Those final 30 seconds where you rip out his heart were gnarly, but once again the unnecessary last phase with Penguin killed the buzz so quickly that it's forgettable. To end on the high note, this is the first boss chronologically that really separated itself from the pack as an actual multi-phase fight with unique mechanics and movesets. So for that, this odd combo get a commendable spot at number 4. You disappoint me, detective. Before I get too deep into my script, I'm never calling him Raish. I think Raish sounds really dumb and Roz is valid in my opinion, so suck it nerds, his name is Roz. Alright, so I'm gonna be real right now, I think Roz is a bit overblown. He has a fantastic story that definitely adds some mirage to his fight, but when I take off those rose colored glasses, I just don't think the fight itself was that good. Similar to Grundy, Roz is like a watered down clay face with a worse atmosphere and is less original. He didn't exactly stand out how I'd expect him to because he only has two attacks when he's big and a very basic combat sequence when he's not. The part where you slowly break down the militia of Sand Ninjas was interesting only because of that really cool jump they do at the beginning, but otherwise it's like any other group of enemies and there's no flavor. 
When he's large, it's a bit more interesting, and it can be intense trying to juggle timing your shots through his barricade as well as dodging his shurikens and swords, but after like three phases of the same thing, you get used to it. At the end, you do that reverse battering thing which exists to exist, but I won't count it as a part of the fight, so for what he is, he's pretty good and has a solid placement at number three. It was the performance of a lifetime! Coming in as the runner-up is Clayface. His story was hands down the best and most intriguing of probably any boss I've ever fought. It blew my damn mind watching the Joker reappear, and it set up the fight as what it should be. A brawl over the antidote, not a personal rivalry between Batman and Carlo. Clayface reminds me a lot of a Mario or Zelda boss now he has a moveset in which all of his attacks are solely based around a single ability. He's very unique in that regard, but at the same time he only has like 4 or 5 moves which don't vary too much from each other excusing the ball. That attack is very well made though, because if you're good at knowing your surroundings, you would know to bait him into the bomb traps around the arena, dealing massive damage. This is where I stop the positivity, because the first phase beats out the second by a mile, which is why he's a silver medalist. The second phase felt rushed as instead of difficulty through movesets and timing, they chucked in like 20 of those clay guys and called it a day. Chopping those dudes up with a sword was satisfying, but I can't commend it because it's so lazy. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the freeze blast mechanic is super off. Half the damn time, I'll throw it dead center in his mouth and it does nothing, which is why I died back to back when he was 1 HP. Unfortunate, but as the second best out of 11, there's not a lot to be down about either. Death is called Batman. The undisputed champion of Arkham City is Mr. Freeze. Just like Scarecrow, for me, this wasn't even close. One could vouch for Poison Ivy in Asylum, and I give it a fair chance, but I wouldn't even care to listen if anyone says Freeze isn't the cream of the Arkham City crop. What makes him so great is the original spin on typical stealth boss fights mixed with absurdly high quality, but let me further elaborate. He tests your limits of predators, skill-wise and knowledge-wise. He follows your footsteps through heat detection, which allows for a variety of takedown options if you bait correctly. The variety comes in the intricate arena design. Said arena was designed to allow up to 12 different takedowns, but there's a catch. After each takedown you do, he adapts to prevent you from doing the same one twice, such as how he'll freeze the pool if you electrocute him or turn on his jetpack if you take him out from behind. All in all, Mr. Freeze is my definition of boss perfection, something everyone else has miserably failed to achieve so far. Luckily, we found a pot of gold and I'm gonna say it, this mad scientist is undoubtedly one of the greatest bosses of all time. Thank you guys so much for tuning back in for our second Arkham Boss Ranking. Making these videos have been some of the most fun we've ever had together and we appreciate all the support we've received and we especially appreciate you if you made it through the whole thing. Back to the conclusion, I think we've gone through the worst of the worst in the Arkham series in terms of bosses so hopefully WB Montreal can live up to my expectations and step up their game in Arkham Origins. Also, make sure to check back in next week for Alex's ranking of the Paper Mario Thousand Year Door chapters. And with that said, deuces.